Atheist Nomads, episode 147, Dispatches from the Culture Wars with Ed Brayton. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. And joining us today is Ed Brayton, the author of the Dispatches from the Culture Wars blog on Patheos. Ed, welcome to Atheist Nomads. Thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. What can I Man, you're a celebrity. Glad to have you on. <laughs> Micro celebrity. <laughs> How, well, you, <laughs> you've been on TV. <laughs> yeah, I've been on TV a few times, I guess. But although it's funny with the Rachel Maddow thing, I was on there twice. I, to this day, and this has been six years since I was on her show. I still have people every now and then that will contact me, like you know, friends of friends, and can you put me in touch with Rachel Maddow? <laughs> and I'm like, she wouldn't be able to pick me out of a police lineup. She has no <laughs> clue who I am. You know, I was on the show twice six years ago for six minutes apiece. She wouldn't have the foggiest clue who I am. <laughs> well, that is a hell of a stretch to be on her show. I mean, six minutes each time, that's that's long. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know exactly how long it was, but, you know, something in that range anyway. <laughs> but, yeah, it's just, they think like we're, you know, going out to dinner or something i've never met the woman i don't really talk to a producer except on the air you know yeah <laughs> so it's not like we're, we're bffs or anything <laughs> oh, i wow. love to be I think she's great but no, not the reality you well, know uh i i first became aware of you when you uh, started free thought blogs uh i don't know if people are aware of these or not anymore but you know there is a lot of interesting topics always being raised on there <laughs> That's a polite way of saying drama and controversy, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I actually started blogging in 2003. I'm into the middle of my 12th year now. Mm, nice. Uh, and uh, I started Free Thought Blogs in August of 2011. Uh, yeah. We launched August 1st, 2011. And that was because I was on science blogs previous to that. And science blogs got sold to National Geographic. Oh, shit. Uh, and National Geographic immediately, immediately began talking about standards and practices. Oh, goodness. Uh, yep. And in a conversation with the uh, vice president who was sort of in charge of that acquisition, um, I asked him, you know, specifically, what would that entail? I mean, are there certain subjects you'd want us to avoid? And he said, well, to give you an example, he said, we we're in about 97 countries around the world. So we're really sensitive to like cultural insult. That sort of thing. So he said, for example, those Danish cartoons of Muhammad, <laughs> we wouldn't allow those to go on our servers. And I said, well, that's kind of a problem because those cartoons are on my blog right now. And I'm not <laughs> taking them down. So I think we've hit an impasse here. Um, <laughs> oh. And I said, I just, that's it's not acceptable to me. So, it's, you know, what I love about blogging is being able to talk about whatever I want, mm -hmm. in whatever way I want to talk about it, you know? And so, and I think given the violence surrounding those cartoons, I think it's important to put them up, uh, yeah. to show solidarity with the people who were, you know, killed over that, yeah. many of them around the world, you know? So I said, that's, that's just unacceptable to me. Um, and I decided I wanted to go start my own network. And I, I called PZ Myers and we were the two most popular bloggers on the science blogs network. And I, asked him if he had talked to this vice president uh, as well. And he said, yeah. And I said, I'm guessing you had the same reaction that I had to this whole standards and practices thing. And he said, yep. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to go start my own network. Do you want to come? And he said, yeah. So uh, that's how that got started. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, Frangula helped uh, get me some of my, my early firebrand and, and rage going. <laughs> <laughs> So. See, and I was the opposite, actually. PZ and I used to get in big fights over this because I'm much more of a moderate, mm -hmm. uh, those things, than he is. 
uh, an accommodation, as they call me. I hate that term. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, we used to have huge fights over it back in, like, 2006 and 2007 when we first started on science blogs. Uh, so much so that when it, I think 2008, we get, we met in person at a conference uh, at American United for Separation of Church and State Conference in D.C. And when we both had said on our blogs that we were going to be there, some of our readers began to speculate that there would be a fist fight. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Which anybody who knows either one nice. of us knows that's ridiculous. You know, neither one of us is uh, is uh, violence prone in the least. You know, I haven't been in a fight since the eighth grade, you know. Uh, so, but, and we met and we actually got along fine. And, and as many people will tell you, anybody who's ever met him, uh, he is an entirely different person. Face oh, sure. to face. Oh, he yeah. is in his blog. He writes like he's 12 foot tall and carries an ax. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dustin, when was it? 2011 that me and me and you met PZ in, yeah. in, uh, in Portland. Yeah. Emmett? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and he's, He's really kind of shy and oh yeah, funny. he's kind of a teddy bear. Yeah, yeah, he's not at all. If you if you just knew him from his writing, you would you would <laughs> be quite surprised uh, the first time you meet him, as a lot of people are. So and, and very soft spoken <laughs> too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, which which is probably why he writes the way he does because all of that nerd rage being teased in school. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh boy. So how about you? I mean. How were you raised? What was what was your background? Were you... uh, religiously, I have a weird background. Um, I was raised by an atheist and a Pentecostal. Right. Oh, who wow. Who are still still married, by the way. Nice. Um, yeah. So who ag- who accommodates who? Uh, they just uh, ne- never the twain shall meet. Basically, right. uh, hmm. they don't talk about it. Uh, um, who's who's the atheist? My father is an atheist. My stepmother is Pentecostal. So does he so, just stay at home watching football on Sundays? Um, yeah, he didn't go to church or anything. Yeah, but she, when they got married, she was sort of a middle of the road Methodist. Um, and then she about, I don't know, I was probably, they got married when I was nine. And I went to the Methodist church with her uh, and I became a Christian. Nice. Uh, and then I was about 15, I think, when she switched to the Assembly of God. Oh, and I think I went with her twice and went, oh, no, this is not happening. These people are <laughs> whacked. Um, oh, wow. And I went back to the Methodist church. Um, so, uh, but I was a Christian as a teenager. In fact, I was the, one of the leaders of the local Youth for Christ. Mm. Um, and then at about 16, between 16 and 17, as I got, you know, sort of less ignorant, started learning more about the world, I started asking questions about the Bible that weren't getting very good answers from my pastors and, uh, and engaged in about a year and a half of just really serious study uh, to kind of find out if there are any answers to these questions. And ultimately I decided there just aren't uh, and that it, it didn't make sense to me anymore. And so I, I left it behind. Um, but uh, yeah, very odd upbringing. When I used to, I, when I did stand up comedy for several years, I used to talk about my upbringing, and, I, and my joke was, "This really narrowed my career options. I could either be a comedian or a sniper." <laughs> uh, and they're not hiring snipers, so um, yeah, it's a very unusual way to be brought up. Although I say this, I appreciate it now. Uh, I think it's a good thing for me because I didn't have a default belief. Most people just are whatever their parents are, right? Right. Mm-hmm. I didn't have that option. My parents disagreed completely. So I kind of had to figure things out for myself. Um, and in fact, my dad, uh, over the year, many years that I was a Christian, uh, never once tried to argue with me, dispute it, talk me out of it. Um, you know, if I was singing in church, he'd come and see. Um, but there was never any even discussion about it, really. And then... Uh, as an adult, I, I asked him about it much later. Like, how did you hold your tongue uh, all that time? And his answer was, I raised you to think for yourself. And I just figured you would figure it out on your own. Hmm. I, figured, I figured you would have said whiskey. <laughs> no, no, my dad my dad has never had a drop of alcohol in his entire life. Oh, wow. So uh, he is a, a complete teetotaler. But um yeah, he just said, "I, you know, I, I just figured you'd you'd come to the, your own conclusions and you'd figure it out." And I did. Um, so, and I think it was easier for me 
it wasn't like a traumatic thing to leave my religion behind um, because it wasn't my entire social network as it is for most people. Mm -hmm. um, and because I had the example of my dad where when I, when I decided I just didn't think this was true anymore, it wasn't, oh my God, everything in my life is going to be turned upside down. It was, okay, I'll just be what dad is. So mm -hmm. I think I got away from it without sort of the, uh, what is really common um, difficulties that people have leaving religion behind, where they lose their whole community, their whole social network. Uh, and I, I didn't have that. So I, I consider myself really fortunate uh, for that. Shit, sometimes they're their entire families. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I, and even my stepmother, I mean, she would crawl over broken glass for me. Um, certainly she wishes I would return to the fold, but she loves me and, you know, till, till the, 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 the sun dies out, you know, mm -hmm. there's never been any friction there as a result of that. Um, I've never lost a friend or lost a family member because I'm an atheist. A lot of other atheists do, I know, and I'm lucky that I haven't. Hmm, man. I mean, my family's awesome at disowning each other, but I, <laughs> I, I've lost family for lots of reasons, but never for that. I can't so, even imagine what I could do. I mean, short of being a serial killer, you know? Yeah. Mm. You know, my, my family, uh, everything you could imagine just about, aside from violent felonies, someone in my family <laughs> has done it. And no one has been rejected over it. You know, I have I have friends who you know lost their families, disowned them because they're atheist or because they're gay. Mm. And when I hear stories like that, I just it just kills me. So I just think, man, I can't even imagine what I would have to do other than, like I said, becoming a serial killer or something. Mm -hmm. My parents would never do that to me. You know, I, I, and it just makes me feel worse for them. You know, yeah, it's, it's something I've never had to worry about. You know, I've never had to worry about bringing a girlfriend home and having my family get upset, you know, but, uh, you know, many of my gay friends, if they brought a girlfriend or boyfriend home would get disowned. They have to hide that who they are. I think that's just tragic. Oh, definitely. It's tragic. And for anybody who hasn't gone through it, it's unthinkable how that actually works. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine it, how horrible it must be. You know, you know I, I've heard of a few families where they would rather you, you be an atheist than gay because they're finally starting to learn that, you know, being gay isn't a choice. Uh, but, you know, atheism kind of is. I mean, it's I mean, it's something that you could come away from. Yeah. If if you're, you know, intellectually dishonest with yourself, but still. Yeah, I don't think you can really choose it any more yeah. than I could choose again to be a Christian. Um, totally. If you aren't I, I, convinced that it's true, you you just can't. I don't think you, you could fake it, perhaps, mm -hmm. but you couldn't really believe it. No, but parent, parents could, you know, hope that you would, you know, move away from it. But Right, hope that something would convince you at some point. Yeah. 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 You know, frozen waterfall and three parts bullshit. <laughs> yeah, one of my very dear friends who died um, last fall actually did try this. Um, was that she said to me a few years ago, I, I was happier when I was a Christian. Mm. And I'm going to try to be one again. Wow. And so oh. she started praying every night. She started reading the Bible again. I mean, she was trying to get herself back into it. And after a few months, she said, this doesn't work. But if you don't believe it, you don't believe it. You know? But she wanted to because she thought she was happier then. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads i wow. did just see a, a study i don't know i don't even know how big the sample was but saying that uh, people that go to church twice a week are more happier in general but you know i think that's just really more the sense of community it, Definitely. that's exactly what it is there's actually a study that was done by uh, a friend of mine here luke galen who's a psychology professor at grand valley state university 
Um, and he did a study on this very subject. And the problem is that all those studies that show that people who are part of faith communities uh, are sort of healthier and happier all compared people who aren't part of secular communities. Hmm. But if you do, and CFI Michigan, a group here that I'm on the board of, was one of the samples. And then he also had a couple of them from other countries uh, in which he used the exact same questionnaire that they used to judge sort of emotional health and happiness that they used in the studies that he went on Christians. And, they, and then they compared Christian samples of people who go to church all the time to people who are active in secular communities like CFI Michigan. Hmm. Uh, or like an American atheist chapter and so forth. And when you compare people who are active in r religious communities versus non-religious communities, all of that evens out. Uh, that in fact, the, the, the key to it is that you're part of a community. You have a support network around you, you have people you can count on to be there when you need them. That's what's important. It's community. It doesn't matter whether it's religious or not. Hmm. Yeah. Makes perfect fucking sense. To uh huh. Yeah. Well, because, <laughs> One of the, the huge factors with it is when life gets rough, you need to have a, a support system in place. Yeah. And if you have people that you see every week or especially twice a week, then yes, you are going to be forming those bonds. Those are going to be the people that you can, you can reach out to that will help you out. We have a, a family here that lives about a mile away from me, uh, and you may have seen them, uh, some publicity about them, but Jeremiah Bannister. Uh, and his wife, Angela, their 11 year old daughter, Samantha, uh, was diagnosed with a brain tumor last March, Oh, uh, a very rare brain tumor. She ended up having brain surgery. She's actually doing pretty well now. Um, but, um, when that happened, the CFI Michigan community just completely came together for them the same way the churches do for their members. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they didn't cook a meal for months. People were bringing meals over to them. Uh, people were watching, they had four children. And so the parents had to be at the hospital for very long periods of time um, after the brain surgery. So people were volunteering to take care of their other kids, make sure they got to school, um, you know, donating money because they had to be off work. Uh, I mean, I was incredibly proud of the way the whole community stepped up um, and helped them and are, they're still doing it. You know, even though things have kind of returned to normal, uh, she's still undergoing chemo, um, but the tumor has, shrunk considerably uh and um and she's able to lead a fairly normal life at this point although there's now some indication that this one may, may be starting to grow a little bit so mm -hmm. but it's that kind of community that's that's really the important thing and we have a very strong community of people of people here who really care about one another and it and it's it, it operates in exactly the same way that a church community operates um and that's a good thing i mean we, we criticize religion i mean that but the community that builds up around around faith communities is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, throughout history, when, you know, you go back in like middle ages, uh, the church services, the, uh, you know, masses weren't even in the language the people understood. <laughs> it wasn't uncommon for, you know, this was a big part of the, the, the witch hunts was the fact that these were just pagans who had never actually been converted. They'd sent priests. They were all going and taking part in mass, but, Nobody actually shared any message with them, but it was the central point of the community because they were off trying to survive and they'd have this opportunity to get together and see each other. And so it's always been a, a, a central point of, of, of community. And uh, that is definitely something worth the one thing about it that's worth emulating. Yep. I'm doing a talk now, um, and the title of the talk is Why Atheism is Not Enough. Um, and in that talk, I talk about the importance of building secular communities for precisely that reason and for organizing to do th the kinds of things that churches do in terms of charity work um, and working with them. You know, that's something that we've done a lot here locally uh, is that our, our, our group here meets and gets together with Muslims, Christians, Hindus, Buddhists, um, and, you know, builds Habitat for Humanity houses, hmm. uh, plants community gardens, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, and where we, where we agree on the need to, uh, to do service for others, let's pool our resources and do it together. I'm all for that. And, uh, and, when, and, and doing things on our own as well, as we have done for many years. Um, and that's why I, I have 
really shifted the focus of my activism from atheism to humanism. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not that I don't identify as an atheist anymore. I do. And I think that's important. I mm -hmm. think we should identify as atheists if that's what we are uh, because of the social stigma that still attaches to Definitely. that term. And I think that's important. But in terms of what we actually do, um, I'd like to see a lot more effort put into building communities mm -hmm. and um, putting humanist ideals into action. If we really believe that uh, justice and equality um, uh, and, and fairness are important values, then we need to do what we can to make those things a reality in our communities. Um, and if we do that at a local level and everybody does it and, it, you know, it builds up. And um, so it's that kind of activism. It's, you know, fight against uh, discrimination against LGBT people, mm -hmm. um, and racial discrimination. I think those things are really important. Uh, and I think they are very much a part of my activism as both an atheist and a humanist. Uh, because the fact is that the root of a lot of that kind of inequality is in based in religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we want to fight against the negative effects of religion, um, then that includes the mistreatment of women. It includes the mistreatment of gay and lesbians and bisexuals and, and transgender people. Um, that includes racial inequality because religion has been a huge root of that over the centuries as well. Um, and so it's not enough, although it's important. I don't, one of the things I say in the speech is that doesn't mean I want you to stop doing what you're doing. If what you do is counter apologetics, for example, that's important. Keep doing it. If what you do is, is um, evolution and creationism stuff, keep doing it. It's important mm -hmm. work, but that's not enough, you know? At least it isn't enough for me anymore, and it was for a long time. Uh, but I've reached the point where that's just not enough, um, uh, that I think we need to, to take it further and sort of take it to, to actions. And uh, the credit for sort of um, pushing me in that direction, I think, comes from, well, it comes primarily from, from two people. One was actually Bishop Tutu, <laughs> um, because in 2009, I had the chance to meet him. Oh, no shit. And spend a few hours with him uh, in a small group of people. He came to Michigan State University to give commencement. Um, and one of my dear friends is an Episcopalian leader on that campus. And so he's an Anglican archbishop, which is the same thing. So she arranged this meeting with a small group of people. And we got into a conversation about the fact that he and I agree on almost everything politically. Mm hmm you know, he isn't just a racial activist. I mean, this is a guy who fights against, you know, inequality of discrimination against gays and women and, and all of that. Um, and I said, we, we agree on all this stuff. And yet I'm an atheist and you're a Christian. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, he said, listen, the reason I do this is because I genuinely believe that if Jesus were alive, that's exactly what he would be doing. You know, just <laughs> like he said, those without sin cast the first stone. And just like he said, forgave the woman at the well and all of that. He said, I think that's what he would be doing today. And he said, but ultimately, I don't care where you start from. If you start from an entirely different premise for me, but we end up at the same conclusion, then we're on the same team. Hmm. Uh, and that really kind of resonated with me. Um, and then uh, about three or four years ago, I um, started doing some work with the Foundation Beyond Belief, uh, just some media work for them very, very part time. And Dale McGowan, uh, who's a founder um, and until about a year ago, the executive director of Foundation Beyond Belief has been a tremendous, well, a tremendous friend, but also a tremendous inspiration um, to me. And I helped plan the conference we put on in 2014, which is called Humanism at Work. Hmm. Uh, and I liked that title because it sort of expressed this idea that, it, you know, if you have this set of humanist ideals, and you don't do anything about it, it's just a picture on your wall. Um, you know, what, what good does that do anybody? If you aren't actually doing something uh, to help make your community and make society better, um, then frankly, you're full of shit. You know, you're just yeah. talking. And if you don't put that talk into action, you aren't doing any good. Definitely. 
<laughs> Fucking I ain't shit. No, it, it's no, I totally agree with you though. Some people definitely need to be called out for that too. Well, it's not so much calling out people, hey, you're not doing enough. It's just I you know, the message of that talk that I give is just to try to inspire people to to do more. You know, mm-hmm. I, I don't have interest in calling some specific person up for that. Because listen, I was the same way. Until the last few years, you know, I was perfectly content spending my time arguing with Christians <laughs> um, and calling people stupid, you know, and I still do that. <laughs> But it just, it isn't enough. It's not that we should stop. It's that we need to do some more positive things as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and I I think there's a a certain part of it is just people need a, especially those who have been harmed and and hurt by religion, need that outlet. It's kind of a, a therapeutic exercise to just rail on religion for a while. And until they work out some of that. Uh, it's kind of hard to focus on actually helping people. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, there is that kind of uh, maybe you have the five stages of grief. Maybe mm-hmm. we should we should codify this as sort of the five stages of deconversion. You know, that a lot of people, for for good reason, in many cases, are really angry uh, when they leave religion. I, like I said, I wasn't. I didn't have that that sort of traumatic experience. Um. But I was also a young enough man that I was super arrogant <laughs> uh, and thought I, you know, I thought every religious person was an idiot and which is clearly not true. Um, you know, some people, you know, when you, when you feel that you've been taken or swindled your entire life, you know, or lied to your entire life. Yeah. They could definitely yeah. have some anger over that. Yep. Understandably so. Um, yeah. and, uh, and and a lot of people just have real needs to fill because, like we said earlier, you've lost your whole support network. Mm-hmm. Um, you have some complicated feelings about that, some horrible feelings about that. So, yeah, I think there are some stages that, that, that a lot of people, maybe most people who've left religion for atheism go through. Um, and they have to kind of work those things out. And it takes some time. And some people probably never do, you know. Um, but I think for a lot of people, there's those sort of stages that you go through and then you sort of reach a point where you're, okay, I'm, I'm at peace with this. At least I don't feel the need to lash out at people, um, anymore. For me, I do that more politically than anything else, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Don't get me started on Donald Trump supporters. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right, we're about halfway through, so we're going to go ahead and take our second break now. Uh, we didn't actually get through to a uh, nice stopping point for the first break, so I'll just, just well, for listeners, I previously cut that in. Um, that's why it might have sounded a little awkward. Um, but, yeah, we'll be back in just a, a few moments. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, Or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. (laughs) Back with my caffeine delivery vehicle of choice. Oh, God, that shit is nasty. (laughs) <laughs> I see. I think coffee is nasty. So, uh, oh, yeah. well, coffee can be all right, but I'm more of a Coke, Dr. Pepper, like energy drinker. I go back and forth between Diet Mountain Dew and Coke Zero. The Coke uh, Zero is pretty decent, especially a yeah, cherry Coke Zero. And I drink a lot of iced tea as well. So, oh, um, yeah. I'm a coffee guy. Don't, I don't drink either coffee or beer, and I'm not Mormon. <gasps> so, or I know that makes me like a milk bucket under a mule. I'm so out of place with anyone that I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an, ex, you... I'm an ex-Aventist, so of course I drink coffee and beer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, lots of bacon. Are you teetotaling also? Me? Yeah. Uh, you know, I just I don't drink very much. Um, pretty rarely. Okay. A glass of wine with dinner is, is about, you know, all I do. Okay. Um, and that's really because I have a really high tolerance for alcohol. Mm. So drinking doesn't really do anything for me. And if I want to actually have it affect me, I'm yeah. going to drink a lot. Right. Um, okay. So I figured out a long time ago, I'm going to have as much fun drinking a Coke 
so on the rare occasions that I actually go out to a bar, which is not really my scene, uh, you know, with some friends, I'll just make sure everybody gets home. I'll have okay. as much fun anyway. So I'll write this down. Not a cheap date. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, don't have the tolerance I had a few years ago, but have, have definitely had the same problem. And uh, I like the taste. So yeah, other than wine, I really don't like the taste mm. of alcohol. I'm not a big wine drinker uh, at all because I don't like the taste. <laughs> I don't drink wine often because, uh, like with beer, I have to regulate because uh, if my stomach gets too full, I can't burp. And if you're drinking a lot of beer you really need to be able to burp. And so I have to drink it slow. Wine, on the other hand, doesn't have that natural slowing down as I'm my stomach's <laughs> filling up with gas. So I'll just chug glass after glass after glass, and before I know it, I'm completely shit-faced. <laughs> and the bottle's empty. <laughs> well, then you got to drink cheap wine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then the box is half empty. <laughs> All right, all right. Actually, boxed wines are respectable these days. It's not like it used to be where you go, oh, come on, you, you're a Philistine if you drink that. <laughs> these days, that's actually changed quite a bit. Yeah, I don't do boxed wine because of the hangovers. At least with no. a bottle, there's a, a definite stopping point. <laughs> well, there is the box, too. It's just a lot further yeah. into the... Yeah, <laughs> a lot more before you get to that starting point. It hurts a lot more the next day. <laughs> I don't know if you, there's a book called The Wine Trials. Uh, which is an incredible book that basically points out that the entire wine tasting sommelier thing mm -hmm. is total bullshit. Yeah. It's a complete bull. Uh, they, you know, they did all these blind taste tests where, you know, for example, they would take, and these are experienced wine drinkers, some of the professional sommeliers um, <laughs> that they did these tests with, and they would blindfold them. And for example, one of the tests was they took a, uh, a white wine, and they serve them all a white wine and then ask them to describe the taste. And they used, all of them used these sort of traditional white wine descriptors, crisp, dry, um, that kind of thing. Well, then they served them red wine, but it was actually the exact same white wine with food coloring in it. <laughs> and oh, now wow. they described it as fruity, full bodied, all the words you use for red wine, not. <laughs> uh, for white wine. So they're just completely full of shit. Oh, know? wow. And they found that if you don't, if they don't know what the vintage is, if they don't know what uh, type of wine it is, and therefore don't know how much it costs or how prestigious it is, <laughs> that there was actually a slight negative correlation between price, prestige, and how they rated the wine. But if they knew that it was, you know, uh, uh, a Chateau Petrus, uh, then mm -hmm. they would rate it much higher than they would to Buck Chuck, you know. <laughs> oh, wow. And the funny thing is, I got sent that book, and I read it about a month after I had dinner in Vegas with a very wealthy friend who's really into wine. And we had a bottle of Chateau Lafitte Rothschild 1991, very prestigious mm. vintage, $500 bottle of wine, oh. uh, a Burgundy, um, and I loved it. I thought it was the best wine I'd ever had. It paired perfectly with the, the mm -hmm. meal that I had. And then I came back and I read this. And, and one of the studies that that they cite says that if you know that it's an expensive, prestigious bottle of wine, you will enjoy it more. Yeah. Oh, sure. And if you don't. Yeah. And it's not that you think you enjoy it more. You actually do. And so when I, when I got back and I read this whole book and I thought, did I actually like that wine as much <laughs> as I thought I liked that wine? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought, oh. I'm glad I didn't have to pay for it because I've been had, you know. <laughs> oh, about a year ago, uh, Lauren and I did a uh, wine tasting class. At least that's what we were told it was going to be. It was actually a class on terroir. So mm -hmm. literally studying, well, what it literally means, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, is earth. So it's learning everything about the wine so that theoretically, if you have a good understanding of terroir, you can taste the glass of wine and you can describe the soil, climate, and location that it was from and, and the culture that it's, it comes from. And the instructor was like a, a fourth order sommelier or whatever that crazy French word is. Uh, 
and I know it's not fourth order, but he was way up there in the right, the, the levels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we got to one of the wines. It was uh, one of the whites. It was two reds and two whites. And he wanted us to describe it. For both Lauren and I, we were the only ones who would come out and actually say it. It tastes okay, but it smells... We said like a barnyard. What I wanted to say is it smells like cow shit. <laughs> and there's actually a term for that particular smell. And it is this particular one came from uh, Chile. And uh, there are some wines that are very expensive and very sought after who literally, which literally smell like shit. Oh no, it's like the civic coffee or whatever the, the fucking uh, shit coffee that the cats eat the beans and Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm. Now these wines don't, don't have shit anything. in it. But oh man, it was bad. <laughs> okay, it tasted fine. It smelled terrible. Kopi Luwak. Oh, that's what it was. I, I yeah. remember Robin Williams way, way back in the 80s doing a, a, a mockery of wine tasting where he tastes wine and went, absurd yet flaccid. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's just so much of it is just pretentious bullshit, you know? Yeah. All right. So now for something completely different. Are you into photography or videography or what? Uh, I'm not into photography. Uh, but yeah, I have the green screen and I have my. Uh, my lights and all that, and that is uh, set up to do some videos, uh, which I have now completely changed my mind. I don't even need any of that stuff for what I'm going to do. So, oh. uh, <laughs> um, so now friends are using it. Actually, Justin Schieber and Dan Linford uh, oh. taped a bunch of stuff in here over the last few days uh, while Dan was staying with me in town. Um, but um, I I'm going to start doing a video series on constitutional law. Hmm. It was my favorite thing to write about um, and uh, sort of explaining some common law concepts in plain English. Mm -hmm. um, and so originally I was going to do this with the green screen and I actually have a sample video of it um, with uh, uh, the I project up onto the green screen. I use the inside of the Supreme Court building. And so I got all this equipment for that and with me appearing on camera and talking and then having a uh, a sort of blackboard over my left shoulder, putting cases and concepts and that sort of thing. Mm, well, nice. I decided just a few days ago to completely change this concept. Uh, <laughs> and now I'm going to do it as animations, which is going to require <laughs> learning some new stuff mm -hmm. um, where it's just going to be my voice and then we'll animate some things <clears throat> over that. And so I now have to learn how to use how to do that using probably PowerPoint. Um, but uh, you know, I want to explain, uh, you know, I've got already got some scripts written for it and I want to do, you know, for example, I'm probably going to do a three or four part series on the concept of originalism, uh, which I think is really badly misunderstood mm -hmm. uh, by most people who aren't into con law. And I think a lot of liberals in particular tend to think of originalism, well, that's a conservative idea, so it's, it's wrong. Do you want to give a, a, a little definition of it? Well, originalism is this idea or set of ideas about how you interpret the Constitution. It's called an, an interpretive mode or a theory of interpretation, which is that if you want to determine the meaning of a specific provision of the Constitution, then you would look at the what it meant at the time. Mm -hmm. And there's there's three different versions of conservative originalism. And the first one was original intent. But that actually has fallen completely out of favor. And that, but that's what everybody thinks it still is. Uh, but it's not. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is it's very difficult to discern intent quite often, mm -hmm. especially 225 years later, and especially given that the founding fathers that wrote it had some pretty big disagreements on what it meant. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, for example, just take the Establishment Clause uh, of the First Amendment. Uh, Congress will make no law respecting an establishment of religion. So does that forbid the federal government or the president from issuing a declaration of prayer that's not coercive, that's merely voluntary and, and, and advisory that on this particular day we invite you to pray and fast? Um, well, if you're going to look at the original intent or, 
or what the men who wrote it uh, and followed it immediately afterwards thought it meant. Washington and Adams, the first two presidents, issued lots of those. Jefferson and Madison, the third and fourth presidents, didn't and thought they were wrong. Uh, so <laughs> who wins? You know. Yeah. So original intent can sometimes be very difficult. So after original intent, then you had something called original public meaning, um, which is to look at how they explained the, the 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 operation of those provisions to the public. Uh, and in the in the in the the uh, case of the Constitution itself, minus the Bill of Rights. The primary source for that's going to be the Federalist Papers, mm -hmm. which were written by John J. Alexander Hamilton and James Madison to explain to the public, specifically the people of New York, because it was published in New York newspapers first, a series of 82, I think, essays, 81 or 82, um, that literally went clause by clause in the Constitution and said, this is what this means, so that they would know whether they wanted to vote for it or not. So that's an example of original public meaning, what the public okay. was told it meant by the people who framed it. Um, that's a little more certain than original intent but in many cases. You still have the problem with that of you have what the public understood that one person thought it meant. Well, but they were writing with each other. So it wasn't just one person. Okay. Uh, they sort of represented, the, okay. you know, but there are still going to be some clear disagreements yeah. there. You know, you still have that problem of sometimes there are disagreements. Um, and then you have something called original uh, expected application. Oh. Um, so those are the three sort of conservative concepts of originalism. But originalism doesn't have to be conservative. There are two other versions of it. One and it, one's called liberal originalism, but it's really libertarian originalism. Uh, and that was uh, a legal scholar named Randy Barnett from Georgetown School of Law uh, who wrote a book about that. Uh, and then there is another one that just came out a few years ago, and it's the one that I think is the best. And it was Jack Balkin, a law professor at Yale, uh, and he calls it living originalism as a way of blending together the conservative idea of originalism and the liberal idea of a living constitution. Hmm. And what I like about his uh, sort of theory of interpretation is that he says both of these are legitimate ways to think about how to interpret the Constitution, but it's going to depend on what specific provision you're talking about, because some of them can't be abstracted at all. Like, for example, the Constitution says you have to be 35 years old to be eligible for, for president. It doesn't say you have to have reached an age of maturity mm -hmm. where we can debate what that means. No, it says 35 years old, period. There's no way to abstract that. There's no way to uh, to make that mean anything other than what it clearly means. So in that case, originalism is an absolutely valid you know, way of interpreting that. He said, but in many other cases, you have broad concepts. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> that isn't nearly as mathematically cut and dry as the age of the president, right? Well, Does it, that mean no prior restraint? Does that mean no punishment after publication or uttering? Clearly, yeah. there are exceptions to it, right? We mm -hmm. have laws against perjury, laws against fraud, laws against libel. Many so, of which were, were enacted by the Founding Fathers. Well, not only that, I mean, you just look at prior restraint. The Sedition Act mm -hmm. was passed by Congress th that included many of the same men who wrote the Constitution, signed into yeah. law by John Adams. That's an act that threw newspaper publishers in jail yeah. for criticizing the government, including Ben Franklin's grandson. Um, before the ink was dry, they were contradicting it. So yeah. <laughs> that's why original expected application is a bunch of nonsense because it presumes that everything these men did would be in line with what they thought the Constitution mandated. These are politicians we're talking mm -hmm. about, not plaster saints. They're perfectly capable of contradicting themselves, of, of, of saying one thing and doing another, just like all of us are, you know. Oh, and Jefferson's a great example of that. He criticized Adams through and through for uh, breaking the, the word of the Constitution. Well, then once Jefferson was president, he got the opportunity to buy Louisiana. Clearly unconstitutional. Completely unconstitutional thing to right. do under yeah. his own standards. Yeah. He did it anyway. 
Right. And and he he was right about Adams. I mean, that one of the big um, bones of contention in that 1800 election was the, the Sedition Act. Uh, there's a Jefferson who was a furious opponent of that. He said this is a clear violation of the First Amendment. Uh, and he reversed it. When he took office, he ended up pardoning uh, mm-hmm. the, the newspaper people who had been put in jail. He ended up paying their fines for them. Um, yeah, and then he went ahead and, and violated the Constitution himself. There isn't a president we've ever had that hasn't violated the Constitution. Yeah. You know? um, so we need to, one of the big problems in this country is that we look at the founding fathers as though they were plaster saints. You know, men endowed by God with character and integrity and oh bullshit. They stabbed each other in the back. They undermined each other. They, I mean, they killed one another in some cases, right? Aaron Burr and Alexander mm-hmm. Hamilton. Um, I mean, Aaron Burr was a vice president. Yeah. Sitting vice president killed the former secretary of the treasury. Yeah. You know, so these were not like saintly, godly men. These were politicians, uh, human beings prone to the same internal contradictions, the same pettiness, the mm-hmm. same violence. You know, it's it's so much healthier, I think, to view them as flawed human beings than as as uh, plaster saints. You know? If you like the show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com use the links on the right side of the page one dollar an episode is all we ask please think of the kittens yeah flawed ex- human beings who wrote an experimental document they some of them called it the great experiment and it served us well it served us mm-hmm. very well but only because we have amended some of its really terrible provisions yeah right i mean it didn't yeah. include the right of women to vote. It didn't include the right of black people to vote. It, it preserved slavery. Um, it didn't apply to the states uh, initially. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so we've made massive changes to it, but changes that were allowed by the structure of the Constitution that they put mm-hmm. together. And I think it served us very well, but it's not perfect. Well, we've also, it, it, even like it, it applying to the states to a certain extent, yes, the 14th Amendment did some of that, but the way it's actually been applied is it gets applied to the states when the courts seem see fit to reinterpret right. it that way. Well, yeah, and this is called the doctrine of incorporation, and it's been sort of in, the, the the Bill of Rights has been incorporated against the states, sort of piece by piece, um, mm-hmm. and, and not in a wholesale way. But if you go back and look at the at the, at the ratification debates over the Fourteenth Amendment when they put it together. The people who wrote it and advocated it were very clear that the the goal was to uh, to apply the Bill of Rights itself, the first state amendments anyway, to the state. Uh, the courts have been slow to, you know, that was passed in 1868, and they didn't apply the Establishment Clause to the states until 1947. Yeah. Uh, so it's taken a while. Some parts still have not been applied to the states, uh, but most have. Uh, and now you have Clarence Thomas the only person on the Supreme Court and almost the only person in all of the legal world who thinks that the Establishment Clause is not incorporated against the states <laughs> and that they are perfectly free to establish a state religion if they want to. The very radical position that Thomas takes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Especially since... It, and what gets me with, with Thomas is he was raised Adventist. <clears throat> Which, as far as, or at least his, his sure? he was raised by his grandmother, who was Adventist. Grandfather, yeah. Or grandfather. And then uh, he converted to Catholicism as an adult. And... Well, he went to Holy Cross University, which is a, a Catholic school. Um, his upbringing is fascinating, because um, he was raised, his grandfather was so poor, um, he didn't speak English until he was like nine years old. Hmm. Oh. Not his grandfather, Clarence Thomas. He spoke Gullah. Uh, they were part of this very poor Gullah community. Uh, didn't even have wood floors. I mean, it was dirt floors, outhouse. You know, um, uh, it's really a remarkable story that that he ended up, um, you know, going to Holy Cross. He was a very good student, very ambitious. Uh, got into Yale Law School on an affirmative action program, but he should be the poster child for affirmative action. 
I mean, what's what's the goal of affirmative action, right? Take a disadvantaged kid who's smart and ambitious and give him a leg up and put him into somewhere where he can compete at a high level and hope that they succeed. Well, he succeeded enormously. He ended up on the Supreme Court. That He should be the poster child for why mm-hmm. affirmative action works, and he's the biggest enemy of affirmative action there is. Do you think that's why he, he uh, isn't known for asking questions, is that he just – doesn't want to talk in his uh, the accent that he has. No, because the accent's long gone. I mean, if you've heard him speak, it's not. Uh, uh, you know, he speaks perfect English. Um, I, I've honestly really haven't heard him speak. Yeah, no, he, he and, speaks perfect English. And I, I, you know, I heard actually, that he didn't ask a question for like ten plus years. Right, he asked one this year for the first time in about yeah. a decade. Although, yeah. listen, I've defended him on this. I think this is the worst criticism. I think he's absolutely right about this. Uh, and his argument, and he said this publicly, is that the rest of the justices ought to shut up and listen. It's the yeah, it's the lawyer's job to present the case, and right. If they... And 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 if you if you're a con law geek like me who actually listens to the transcript, or listens to the oral argument, right. and Reads the transcripts, and very few people do. Um, you quickly figure out that what's going on is grandstanding. Mm-hmm. And what's going on is the justices are arguing with one another through the use of questions. Yeah. And particularly it's Scalia, not anymore, obviously, but for, you know, more than two decades, it was Scalia and Justice Breyer. They were almost always the two that asked the most questions mm-hmm. and they would argue with one another and barely phrase it as a question. So they would say, you know, one of them would say, well, you know, uh, uh, you know, Mr. So-and-so, what about this? What about this angle on it? And the guy would start to answer. And then, you know, the other one would jump in and go, well, you know, uh, counselor, isn't your real point this? <laughs> you know? And they, they're just, it's a bunch of nonsense. They need to, first of all, the, the advocates, the, the attorneys get 30 minutes maximum to present their case. Mm-hmm. About half the time, they don't even get the first sentence out. Before someone's jumping in with a question. <laughs> right. As far as I'm concerned, they could eliminate the oral argument almost completely. It does <laughs> oh, virtually yeah. nothing. By the time they get to oral argument, all of those justices have read the district court record, the appeals court record, the rulings of both. In a controversial case, a hundred or more briefs, mm-hmm. or at least they've made their law clerks uh, read them and give them a summary. Um, <laughs> but uh, they know how they're going to vote. Yeah. That's decide, they decided that long before they get to oral argument. You know, very almost never is anything said in oral argument that's going to change anybody's mind on anything. And so Clarence Thomas's point has long been just shut up and let them present their case. They've only got a half hour as it is. Hmm. And I think he's right on that. I think it's a really dumb criticism of him. Um, and I get irritated when I see many of my fellow liberals <laughs> making it. <laughs> wow yeah the uh cause I, I've, I've only gone through the transcripts twice uh well, it was two cases then it was in the same week it was the uh doma and california prop 8 case those two cases yeah, which are really interesting cases yeah. those were fascinating to read uh the questions the justices were asking uh, i was able to just reading those predict how I think there was five that spoke up. I knew how all five were going to vote in both but cases. But I, I bet you I could have predicted it before, without even reading the order. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it all matched up with what the predictions would have been, yes. Sure. Yeah. It, it's The oral arguments, you know, as much as I enjoy listening to them, um, it, they're virtually useless, I think. It's a, it's a formality they have to go through mm-hmm. because it's, it's tradition now. The only time it gets interesting is when one of the advocates, one of the attorneys, uses an unusual strategy. Uh, And I'll give you an example of this. One of the big abortion cases, 1992 Planned Parenthood versus Casey, uh, which is a a case in which we very nearly lost Roe v. Wade. The initial vote was 5-4 to overturn Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. And Justice Kennedy was assigned the writing of the majority opinion to overturn Roe v. Wade. And then Justice Souter and Justice O'Connor started working on him, and they changed his mind, and he flipped his vote. And he ended up writing the five to four majority ruling upholding Roe v. Wade. 
Um, but what was, that's what's interesting about that case is the attorney for Planned Parenthood and for the ACLU did a very daring strategy where that case really wasn't about the central holding of Roe v. Wade. That case was about these sort of um, restrictions like waiting periods, spousal notification, parental notification. It was about that. It wasn't about whether anybody had a right to have an abortion. Mm -hmm. But the the attorney for Planned Parenthood, and I heard Ms. Catherine something, and I'm blanking on what it was, very boldly argued in her oral argument, this case is about the central holding of Roe v. Wade. You either overturn Roe v. Wade or you uphold it. And don't play around with these restrictions. Either a woman has a right to choose an abortion or they don't, period. That's a ballsy thing to do. Mm -hmm. That was a really bold, in fact, and a lot of people who were on the same side didn't want her to do that. But she did. And so what ended up happening is Justice Kennedy wrote the ruling in which he said, we uphold the central holding, central uh, ruling of Roe v. Wade, which is that women do have the right to choose to have an abortion. Mm -hmm. But we will allow some of these restrictions as long as they don't pose a, quote, undue burden on that right. So they ended up upholding the central finding of Roe while also upholding some of these restrictions that Pennsylvania had passed. <laughs> um, but the gamble paid off because they had the votes initially. Although if it weren't for Souter and O'Connor working on him, uh, you know, we would have lost Roe v. Wade in 1992. It was it was that close. Wow. Uh, which is not something that was known at the time. We only know that because um, Justice Blackman, after he died, his papers, uh, the tradition is that they become public five years after the, a justice dies. And Justice Blackman was the one who wrote the majority opinion in Roe v. Wade. And so this was of particular interest to him, and he was very upset that it was going to get overturned. And then in there is a note from Justice Kennedy saying, I need to meet with you, and you're going to be happy about the reason, <laughs> because <laughs> I changed my mind. Um, and there's all this correspondence going back and forth as they, you know, talked him into changing his mind. Uh, it's really a remarkable story that, that only came out because his papers were made public in, I don't know, 2002 or 2003, something like that. So hmm, That's fucking crazy. I mean, we, we wouldn't have even had Roe v. Wade uh, for 20 years at that point. Well, think about that. Wow. Think about how close we came to losing the right to choose. One person's <laughs> vote switched. <So> wow. <laughs> I, I find that stuff, it is, I find the Supreme Court so fascinating, partly because it works in secret. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I think primarily because it's the only post in government, it's the only job you can have in government that you can actually do as an intellectual. Anything else that you have to be elected for, mm -hmm. uh, you can't really be an intellectual. You can't follow reason to its conclusion. You have to pander yep. or, you, or you don't win. You have to sell your vote or you don't have a chance. Whereas Supreme Court, because you're and federal courts in general, but especially the Supreme Court, you're appointed for life. Which is why I think we see so many people who have been nominated to the court become very different justices once they're on the court than the people who nominated them thought they were going to be. <laughs> I remember Harry yep. Blackman, who wrote Roe v. Wade, was was appointed by a Republican. Man. Earl Warren, who led the most liberal court in the nation's history, was appointed by a Republican. Um, John Paul Stevens, appointed by a Republican, Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, there seems there's a very clear trend over the last few decades in particular of justices getting on the court and sliding to the left. Very rarely have we seen it go in the other direction. Yeah, Once they it's get a damn, that independence. It's a damn good thing that Obama had Scalia assass assassinated then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> So now we have to hope that Garland, if he gets approved, will slide to the left. He He's relatively liberal anyway. I mean, he's not. I don't think there's a – I mean, certainly there's no way in the world that Obama would have nominated him if he were not pro-choice and pro-equality for, mm -hmm. you know, LGBT. I um, thought he wasn't pro-choice. Oh, yeah, he is. I guarantee okay. it. I guarantee it. Yeah. There's no way he would be 
talking about on the short list, uh, if not. Or the no- the nominee. Yeah, there's just, yeah. well, I mean, he, he, the, the, the short lists for, for Supreme Court nominations are made by third-party organizations. Mm. Uh, for the Republicans, it's the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation. For the Democrats, it's the American Constitution Society. You aren't making that list. You aren't even going to get considered for that list unless you are fairly liberal. Yeah, but he's a he's a fairly liberal guy who has uh, received high praise from Republicans and conservatives for his fair mindedness, uh, and so they thought that worked to their advantage. Um, but uh, I think there may well be hearings at some point. Well, today the, the, way, the way the way I understand it, the Republicans aren't going to uh, vote him in unless Hillary gets elected, then they'll switch and. Put it real quick. I, I think even before then, though, the pressure is already starting to build on this, because when you look at the polls, particularly in states where there are really important Senate elections, mm-hmm. uh, where Republican incumbents are at risk, the public thinks by like 80 to 20 that the, they ought to hold hearings and, and hold a vote on this guy. And so those Republican incumbents in Pennsylvania, for example, um, who are uh, in, in tough fights to hold their seat, they're going to have to come out and say, yeah, we, we disagree with the leadership. We want to do this. We want to hold hearings. And so I think that public pressure starts to build. And the other thing that, that I think is going to happen in the next few weeks is, um, you know, the, the end of June is the end of the Supreme Court term. And that's the last week of June is when they put out usually their most controversial rulings. Um, and... A whole bunch of those are going to end up being four four rulings. Well, they've already kicked a couple back to the lower courts. Well, they kicked the big Obamacare uh-huh. interception challenge one just yesterday back to the yep. lower courts. Yeah. And they did that because they had a four four tie. Yep. And that was a way to kick the can down on the road until they had a ninth vote to decide it. Uh, there's going to be other cases like that where they just are deadlocked and where they don't really have the option of kicking it back down what's going to happen in those cases is they'll have a 4-4 tie. There will be no opinion issued, uh, and the lower court rulings in those cases will stand. They couldn't do that with the Obamacare case because there was a circuit split. Mm -hmm. Once that starts happening, the public's going to get irritated. Oh, yeah. And say, why why are we doing this? Why aren't there, why isn't there a ninth justice on there to decide these cases? We at least Um, need two functioning branches of the government. We're already yeah. down Congress. We can't be down the Supreme Court as well. <laughs> right. And so I think the pressure starts ratcheting up. And I think, uh, especially if it, they don't, I don't even think it's going to need necessarily to wait for the election. If Hillary Clinton wins, then definitely they, uh, you know, then they, they either pass Garland, they either uh, confirm Garland, or maybe they end up with a, a pick they're less supportive of, you know, mm-hmm. a more liberal justice. But I think even if it starts to look like Hillary's going to win uh, in July and August, I think the pressure ratchets up. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the Republicans cave, or at least enough Republicans cave, so that it that forces the leadership's hand. Yeah. So there's uh, three or four have come out on on record saying that yeah. they want the party to at least hold the hearings. Right. Three or four oh. is not enough, though. Right, but I think you're you're going to see a whole bunch more do this as the mm-hmm. summer wears on. Oh, if only Bernie gets the nod, they will appoint Merrick so fast <laughs> it'll make the fucking head spin. <laughs> well, that's um, not going to happen, unfortunately, because I like Bernie. But um, it's almost impossible. But I'm still holding out hope. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, know, I know. I know. I understand being hopeful. Just don't kid yourself into thinking it's really going to happen. Recognize math for what it is, you know. <laughs> well, as long as people don't count super delegates, which they shouldn't, but well, it looks a lot. They better. do. I mean, the super delegate votes do count, whether they yeah, in, in June. Yeah, they, they do count until the convention. No, I agree with that. I agree with that. But um, especially given that Hillary's gotten so many more popular votes uh, mm-hmm. than Bernie, the, the super delegates are going to go. For Hillary, and I mean, she's just so many advantages with the super delegates. So well, much pop- longer period of time of doing favors for them, of helping them win races. You know, I don't think the popular count should 
the popular vote should really mean anything when there's so many states that have caucuses. Washington well, State, I mean. Yeah, but they tend to be pretty small states that have the caucuses, with the exception of Washington and Iowa. Um, they tend to be the smaller states. But I don't think there should be caucuses at all. Yeah, agreed. Uh, but the and caucuses are talking to the he's primarily winning, right? Um, he's won a few primaries as well, but the caucuses are the ones he's sort of done really, really well in. Don't get me wrong. I was a delegate for Bernie, and I still don't want caucuses. <laughs> yeah, I, I think caucuses are just a terrible idea. And I was at the nation's largest caucus ever. Really? Ten th- over 10,000 people show at tr- could have easily been eleven or 12,000 who tried to show up for the Ada County Caucus. Uh, a little over 9,000 actually got in. Uh, it wasn't because they weren't letting people come in, but the line stretched over a mile away from where the convention was. And and what, state, what state are you in? Idaho. Okay. So this is in Boise. and Jeez, That's like half the population of Idaho, isn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> There's about 1.7 million, I think, total in the state now. And oh, that's bigger than I thought it was. One and a half huh. million to 1.7 million. Boise's, uh, the Boise metro area is about 600,000. Uh, Boise itself is is two hundred. Wyoming definitely has like five hundred and fifty thousand people or something. Yeah, like that, the whole state. Yep. Yeah. yeah, sounds about right. I'm I'm in Washington though. I'm ferry ride from Seattle. Oh, okay. Yeah. But um, yeah, the 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 caucus we had in uh, in Boise was a, a complete joke. We had uh, it didn't get done until I think one o'clock. Like they were having to get people to leave so they could get get the arena where half of it was being held ready for a uh, hockey game the next day. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Primaries are just so much easier. Well, caucuses are cheaper <laughs> yep. to do, um, sure. but primaries are, I think, considerably more democratic um, and so much easier. You, know, you just show up and cast your ballot and leave, you know? Um, and uh, so I would do that. And I, I do think they should eliminate super delegates. Um, they should but, eliminate superdelegates, and there should be a a federal. So there should be something out at the federal level that puts it at a open uh, open primaries. Well, but they can't do that, really. the The problem can't they is make it the same across the nation. For well, because years? because the the primaries are not government events. Primaries are party events. The party decides who gets to vote and who doesn't. Mm-hmm. The government, all they do is 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 run the logistics of it. The parties themselves just determine the rules. And in the case uh, of caucuses, they should do that either. In the case of caucuses, the parties or the government doesn't even take care of logistics. It's the, all the party, right. completely. Right. No, I'm just that, talking that's about what, primaries. But. Yeah, that's why I think an open would be even better because you're like anybody can vote for any candidate they want. There's but these are but these are private party events. Mm. The party, if you aren't a member of the party, why should you get to vote for in that party? You know, the same thing is true of all the smaller parties. I don't think the government should be involved in this at all. I think they should be purely private events. I don't think hmm. the government should handle anything for them. Democratic Party wants to put on a primary, Democratic Party pays for it. Um, but, uh, but they are still, despite the fact that the government sort of handles the logistics, they are still private party events. Some of the state, and that's up to the, each state party, too. Um, that's not even determined nationally at the party level as to whether they're open or, or closed. Um, but I, there isn't any reason, I don't think, there isn't any, any logical reason why you should have an open primary versus a closed primary. It's up to the party to decide that, whether they want that or not. The yeah. government shouldn't have any say in it at all. Well, I, I would leave it as up to the party to decide, but... It's all just done through the standard state ballot. That's Part of the, the standard done. primary. That is the way it's done, usually in primary states. Uh, Idaho had a Republican primary back in, I think it was March, and something like 250,000 people voted in that one. The Democratic caucus was a couple of weeks later, and there was a little over 20,000 people who participated. Today was the actual state primary. So you have both a caucus and a primary there. We had a Republican primary, a Democratic caucus, and now the normal state ballot was today for the regular primary. 
and they were expecting the lowest turnout ever today. But so the because regular primary ballot did not include did not include president. president. Okay, it was everybody else. Some of it gets really weird. There are, in fact, states where the parties have both caucuses and primaries. Mm -hmm. And some of them then determine delegates that go to a state convention or a regional convention and then a state convention. And there's these, all these weirdly complex rules on who gets, uh, you know, how you proportion the delegates out based on the caucus and then how you proportion them out based on the, on the, the, the primaries. It's just crazy. The, the, the Republican Party actually does it much simpler than the Democratic Party. In almost every state, it's just winner take all, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and rarely do they hold caucuses. So, um, you know, they're they're kind of easier and more coherent. The Democrats have a more complex system, and in some states where they do this delegates to the state convention thing, the it's just such a labyrinth and you know thing that you have to go through, so that you end up you know, and you've seen some of this. You've ended up in some states, both Republican and Democratic, where. You know, the popular vote went one way and the delegate count ended up the other. And we're talking pledge delegates, not super mm -hmm. delegates. Yep. Because, you know, like Ted Cruz apparently taking a bunch of delegates away from Trump because they were on the ground at the state convention, making sure their people were in place. Uh, and it contradicted the results of the, of the actual popular vote in the state. And so. then you have Colorado, where Republicans didn't hold a primary or a caucus. The party just awarded all of the delegates to Ted Cruz. Hmm, uh, I didn't know that. And not a single person cast a vote, except for wow. the party central committee. Huh. That's oh. the way it used to be done. I mean, it used to be all this stuff was done in the back room. There, there weren't primaries and caucuses until the 40s. Kind of sounds like what just happened in uh, Nevada with the Democrats. Well, the thing in Nevada, I think, is there's been a huge freak out about it, but it actually is not nearly as corrupt and and controversial as it ought to be um you know again they ruled out a bunch of delegates because they hadn't joined the party you know? mm -hmm. rules say you have to be a member of the party and you didn't bother to join you don't get to vote it's a party it's not yeah. a, the government you, you know? can't come to the party convention if you aren't a part of the party <laughs> right uh and yes that does hurt sort of insurgent candidates like bernie sanders and that's i understand that why someone wouldn't like that. And I like Sanders and I, I would rather see him as president than Hillary Clinton. Um, but I, I think the party decides what they want to do in terms of their rules. And if that's what the rules say, that's what the rules say. You still gotta follow the rules, you know? So. Mm -hmm. What yeah. I do hope, and I've said this many times for Bernie, for, with Bernie Sanders is, Hey, I don't hope he doesn't, drop out. No, I don't think he has any chance of winning, but I hope he stays into the convention. I hope everybody who supports him continues to vote for him in the re remaining eight or something, nine mm -hmm. or caucuses that we have. And I think he understands, he knows he's not going to win. He's, he has to pretend like he's still got a chance, but he knows he does. But I think he started this thing with two goals. The short-term goal was to win the nomination. And frankly, I don't think he really thought he had much of a shot at that at the very beginning. He's done way better than I think he realized, ever thought he could. Well, but he overcame a 60-point deficit. Oh, yeah. He's done way better than I would ever have predicted. And I think way better than he would have predicted. But there's a longer-term goal, and it's a really important one. And that longer-term goal is to start a movement to – diminish the influence of big money in our system, in our political system. Mm -hmm. Sure. That is so important. I, that is, it, it's that influence that is preventing us from solving almost every other problem. Uh, and so that movement is incredibly important. And I think he's done an amazing job of getting that message out, of getting young people involved in that. And I hope that once this nomination is over, that those people don't just give up on politics and go, well, my guy didn't win, screw it, I'm going home. I hope they realize that that is a long-term project, not a short-term one, and that if you want to make that a reality, it requires organization and work and money. And so Bernie, I hope, inspired the building of that kind of movement. I think Elizabeth Warren is the obvious person to sort of take over because Bernie's, you know, not going to be around all that much longer, probably. Elizabeth Warren uh, is 
a perfect person to lead that movement into the future. And I hope it succeeds. I, it's very important for the country. So while I have uh, uh, probably angered a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters <laughs> by pointing out that the math simply doesn't add up in terms of the nomination, I really hope he has been successful in starting that movement to change the bottom line reality in our political system, which is the golden rule. Them that has the gold gets to rule. Mm -hmm. And that screws us up badly. Yep. Gives me a chuckle when people bring up his age, though, because Hillary's only like three or four years behind him. Yeah, I mean, they're both up there. Yeah. But I don't, but I don't think Bernie's going to have another run at the presidency. I, no. You know, you know I, I think... Either he gets it now or he doesn't. Right. But I think he recognizes that there's a long-term thing here and that whether he wins the nomination or not, I think for well, you know, however much time he's around, he's going to keep fighting for that. Um, and I hope people keep fighting with him. I think that's incredibly important. All right. So, so go, Bernie. You're not going to win, but go, <laughs> man. I, I want you to go. I think it's great what you're doing, you know? Yep. Um, well, on that note, because uh, that is a, a good place to uh, wrap up, we are uh, out of time. Uh, Ed, that you, that's by far the most political we've gotten on our show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I usually edit out the uh, when we get too too partisan. Um, Ed, what do you have to plug? Uh, nothing. <laughs> um, you I'm going to be at the Reason Rally here in a couple of weeks. Uh, so look forward to meeting a bunch of uh, people that I haven't met yet and seeing a bunch of old friends. Um, so I don't know if you guys are going to be there, but. Uh, uh, you know, if you are, let's meet up. And then if you're, you're one of my longtime readers and, uh, and you're there and you see me come introduce yourself and, uh, can they call you Ed? I hope they call me Ed. <laughs> <laughs> right. my 81 year old father to this day. If you call him, Mr. Brayton will say, Mr. Brayton's my dad. I'm Dave. <laughs> so, <laughs> and where can people find your blog? Uh, dispatches from the culture wars on the Patheos uh, atheist portal. All right. Um, I don't have the thing memorized. There's actually another little thing in there. Patheos.com slash blog slash dispatches. It's the blogs part that I forgot. Yeah. So I would have just yeah. slash dispatches. But yeah, that's that's where you can find my blog, uh, where I write about all this stuff we've been talking about. And uh, and thank you for having me on. This has been a really fun conversation. Yeah. And uh, when you start doing your videos, where is that going to um, They will yeah. be on YouTube at... Um, uh, youtube.com slash approaching the bench that's the name uh, i originally thought of calling it uh i anal <laughs> for i am not a lawyer i like mm. that better uh, you know, i thought yeah maybe that's probably not a good idea <laughs> you would get a you get a lot of hits but a lot of disappointed <laughs> viewers yep. disappointed going this is not what i thought it was going to be <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a blast. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads. And like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. The music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.